I'm Chase. And I'm Timothy. And this is Customer Service. Oh, Cheddar Pie. Ooh, Cheddar Pie. Cheddar Pie. Usually that's a nickname you save for yourself. <laughs> yeah. It's what I do if I'm like annoying Michelle. I'd be mm-hmm. like, Cheddar Pie does not want that. You know what uh, I mean? That Cheddar Pie needs Indian food. I really understand Michelle right now <laughs> in that that would infuriate me. <laughs> if you were Don't coming like up to me while I'm on the couch, talking to yourself, talking about yourself in third person with a crazy nickname, tell me what you want. <laughs> 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 Can't imagine something more obnoxious than that. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, let's going on with you anything oh shit bro it's friday uh it's friday it's 71 degrees outside we got a bunch of lady white sitting out there just cruising so so been a good week yeah you got a big weekend planned you know i don't (laughs) 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 you know i don't i think actually i do think tomorrow we're gonna uh we're gonna do hot pot at cooper's house nice i never hot potted before have you yeah, we've done it like at a friend's houses yeah. back in Chicago and stuff. Yeah, yeah. and you've yeah. done like Korean barbecue too, right? Not in someone's house, but yeah. I've done it plenty at of times. Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I suppose you could, but I guess you'd have to have like a certain type of. Well, the, the, the I've looked into it, and the main thing, for, for, in my opinion, the main thing is there's smoke everywhere. Then, so they make these little a- tabletop apparatuses where it cooks it, but it has a fan that kind of sucks the smoke in yeah. and hard. But then no where does it go, you. bro? You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I don't. You know, I, I would. I wish I could cook in an outhouse outside and then come back <laughs> inside. I don't. I really don't like the idea of it being crazier than it already can be. Yeah. No chance. Yeah. yeah no chance. Yeah. But hot pot. That's fine. Yeah. That's just a little boiler going. You know. Yeah. A little one too. Get some yeah. broth. Yeah. A little uh, umami. What about what about what you? Do you mean, a little umami. <laughs> a little umami. You get a little umami flavor in the broth. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know okay. What I'm yeah. What about you? What are you doing this weekend? Uh, Gia starts back up with ballet. Yeah. So we've got that. Awesome. Other than that, I'd like to do nothing. I have, we've, because she's in, she's in like school again, so we have yeah. like a slightly different morning schedule. And now I'm doing like two, two and a half hour workouts in the morning, and I am beat right Wait, now. Why? So that's because that's we have so the t- we have, cause we have the time before work. So we're Fuck just, it, we're just there. You go, I assume you guys drop her off fairly early then. Yeah, she's she's there at like seven thirty. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. That gives we, you guys time to. Yeah, I mean, work look, out look, I work. you know, I I do like a. I do a uh, like a short ish run to start. I do the actual workout. I do like half an hour in the sauna, 10, 15 minute shower. So like it takes a while. It's not all work. It's not a hundred percent working out the whole time. You know what mm-hmm, I mean? But, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but yeah, I'm, I'm beat from it. Plus like just having to switch and get up early, which I never we don't we never really get up super early because we don't start early, here until early, ten, yeah. so we don't yeah. get up early early. Yeah. So I am beat. Yeah. So well, I'd like to kind of rest. I don't know what that means, but yeah, new. Uh, there's a new reality show. Well, it's not new. It's this new season of The Ultimatum, which is a a great reality show. So is it in the line of dating? Is that the? Yeah. So uh, I'm trying to make sure I know which one this is. Actually, the concept because <laughs> the concept really to me is that's not really the point. Just I just drama. want I just want them bickering. I just want the drama. I want the drama. <laughs> Um, uh, the ultimatum is, I think this is the one <laughs> where it's like, there's a couple and they're not sure if they're going to stay together. So they go and they just start dating other people and then they see, and then inevitably one does not, is not the one that wasn't that interested in the first place. Yeah. yeah. Never wants to go back. Uh-huh. They obviously wanted a way out and this was a way to kind of like crowbar it. Yeah. And then it's, then it, you know, then it's man. Fun. Imagine that. Imagine being like, you know what? Kind of done with this. Let's go on a reality show to air it all out. Yeah. Like, well, I kind of always you, say, I sort of always say that, like, uh, if I was on The Bachelor, for example, or, or one of these shows, I, I would be the guy that, like, would never, you'd never see me. You know what I mean? I'd be, I'd just float in the background where they yeah, would never, yeah. like, not choose you because they got to get rid of somebody specific. Uh-huh. And I'm just there up until, like, the final four. No, you, you know slide, I mean? slide onto the radar. I never make it onto a date. I'm basically just in that big house, just, like, eating free food. Yeah. You know what I mean? Riding and, like, on the zip line in yeah, the pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, this, it's, it's that. It's just, I'm just up in my room. They can't find me exactly. I yeah, just come down for yeah. the major pieces, so I'm in the lineup. You uh-huh, know what I mean? Uh-huh, but yeah. I'm not. I'm not talking to anybody. People forget my name. You know what I mean? And uh-huh. I'm just kind of there to have some little bit of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. I Do wish. You, have I told you about how I think I can survive on the uh, on like one of those reality shows where they drop you off whatever this that shit you watch? Like alone and shit? Yeah, wherever they like they drop you off on the island and I wish nothing some more cursed than... gray place and Yeah. Yeah. 
I wish nothing more than to watch you on a reality show of any sort. I here's, would. Here's I what would, they do. They always drive up the boat, you know, to the to the place. And yeah. They're like, now you get off and you start going into the woods. Here's the first mistake. They start going into the woods. Here's yeah. what I do. I sit right next to that water because uh-huh. that seems to be the place you. That's and every major city is next to water. Of so course, why would yeah, I not be there? Yeah. I wouldn't move at all. I would because you know you can bring some of your own stuff. And they always bring like crossbows and shit. Not me. I'm gonna Not bring. Him. I'm gonna bring like a a Jan Sport full of Perfect Bars and Evian water because all I have to do is like I- exist for like longer than these ding dongs, which is never that long because they break their ankle on the first time they're milling out in the woods. Yeah, yeah. And then I and I sit there and I watch the Kardashians for you know. 30 days while eating yeah. perfect bars and water. My life's basically not that much different other than I'm outdoors. You know what yeah. I mean? No, I hear you, Timothy. So I, 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 I you. guarantee all I'm saying is if I, if I used that plan, uh-huh. Jan sport full of perfect bars and Evian water and a, and a phone so I can watch TV. Yeah. I, out, I at least outlast over half of the, the, the team because yeah. they always go out because they shit themselves eating berries or they shoot yeah, themselves in the foot sick. with a bow yeah, and yeah, they're yeah. messing around yeah. too much. There's a, on, on a loan, you know, like the one you're referencing, there was one season where they did a thing where they were allowing teams of two people, but the catch was, you know, if, let's say if you and I were a team, they would drop us off at separate parts of the island or something. And then we had to find each other and then build a shelter and team team up, go hunting this and that and the other. And one of the teams, you know, guy, it's like a guy and his buddy mm-hmm. get dropped off. And inevitably, the, the, the older fella who isn't necessarily like as fit as the other guy rolls his ankle within yeah. like 40 minutes. And you could tell by the time the guy got there, he goes, are you fucking serious? You're... You, you you're done for real. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? It's like yeah. we did all this. I took off work. You know my I got my mom watching the kids and and you roll your ankle. Yeah. They're go- they're out there goofing around too much yeah. and this is like it, like you should expect it. If you're like going on like a crazy hike that has no path and then you like roll your ankle, you're like, yeah, no shit. Cuz yeah. you're messing around. Yeah. If if the whole goal is to just exist there for as long as possible, I'm just saying I can likely exist there longer by just kind of not doing anything yeah. and doing the stuff I like to do. Yeah, and just take it easy. Yeah. Yeah. So well. that would be my plan. <laughs> On that note, brother. So anyway, I might watch the ultimatum this week, and that's that's all. It was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's, that's all that was. Yeah. <laughs> no other plans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that'd all right. Be good. All right. Who we got today? We got a uh, very good guest today. It's my buddy Bill. Bill from William Frederick. Nice. Uh, what a guy. He also hails from Ohio. Uh, you know, he mentioned didn't grow up in Cleveland, but he's a Clevelander. Um, he's my boy. Uh, just know him through. My buddy Nico, through, who I know through college, and yeah, just he's, yeah, we get into the whole lineage. Yeah, and yeah, 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 yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I was uh, curious. Yeah, yeah. We had Bill on, chatted some William Frederick, talk Cleveland, talk, talk dining in, just a lot of we talk we, being tall, talk about being tall, tall talk. <laughs> we did do some tall talk. Yeah, we started out with some tall talk. So, yeah, yeah. Without further ado, let's uh, let's hop right into it. Uh, very pleasant guest, easy conversation. All right, let's go. Chase, I haven't ate at Taco Bell in 20 years, so don't ask me my favorite menu items. <laughs> <laughs> no, all good, bro. We got other we got other stuff in that realm on the way. Is, anyway. it, for, is it for health? I have to I have follow up. So, is it for health yeah. reasons, or is, are we straight edge, or what's the what's the what what's the reasoning? Or you just don't like it? No, I don't. I don't dislike it. I don't know. I honestly haven't. I think now that you've got me thinking about it, I haven't been through anything that has a drive through attached to it in like 20 years. Is are you, I don't know. are you more of a cooker? I feel like, or bro, it, that's also the, a commitment. No, I'm a dine, I'm a dine in. I, I love the restaurant experience. Okay. Uh, you know what, okay. Bill? That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> uh, just knowing you as, as I know you, and it doesn't surprise me that you're down to take the time to go in and sit down. It's just, yeah, it's my favorite thing. I, actually, I mean, you may know this, but food and coffee are way more interesting to me than clothing. Like, I live for food and coffee so yeah that yeah. whole world is very much my thing and yeah. i care i care about it a lot you know it's i think one of the things that happened with pandemic is obviously what i'm trying to get at is i hardly go to a restaurant anymore and i feel like i would always go to restaurants here in boulder or even in denver pre-pandemic and growing up it was not uncommon to like be we met at McDonald's. We met at Taco Bell. Like those were like yeah. home bases. You know what I mean? And I go into a restaurant once every three months. I feel now like hardly ever. That's interesting. 
I is mean, it? I gotta, I gotta is it a convenience so. a schedule thing? What, it's what a convenience it? thing. It's if I were being transparent, it's an anxiety thing. There's people in there. It's easy. It's much easier for me to just get my food and eat it in my living room yeah. with Michan. You know what I mean? But you know, when you go to a restaurant, you ain't gonna like hang out with other people. It's no, not I like totally other people know. come to the table and sit with. You. No, and, <laughs> I, and, and, I, and I typically have a good time <laughs> when I dine in. I do like to dine in. Yeah. But you built in it my into head, it's like, today. well, I can just get it and eat it at home. You know what I mean? But. Yeah. I mean, I think that that happened with a lot of people where it's like it is it can be a lot nicer of experience. My my thing is like, what, what I love about a restaurant is you go there, you eat and then you come home. Your house does not smell like food. It was as if you've never been around food at all. And I do. I don't like the existence of those two things in the house. In a dream world, I would have a detached kitchen yeah. in the yard or something. <laughs> and that's where I would do that. And then you come in and you're away from it. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, I don't like those existing in the same space. But yeah. Is yeah, what, it is. what you said about anxiety makes sense, though. So here's my thing. I like to sit right next to as close to the kitchen as possible. And I've noticed because I get the same sense when I walk into, say, a crowded restaurant or there's a way mm-hmm, there's mm-hmm. a little bit of a social anxiety about being the person that's not quite seated yet. Yep. But when I'm dining, if I'm close to the kitchen, the anxiety is removed because there's so much anxiety within the kitchen space itself okay. that it almost puts me at ease by seeing the organized chaos that's existing. Yeah. That that's space. like going to a concert. Like I don't feel any sort of anxiety about going to a concert because it's like, there's a mutual understanding of what we're doing and it's on all the attention is focused up front. Yeah. Up front. Yeah. Yeah. I will say too, once I'm seated, I'm good. I don't think about it. Um, Bill, I, not, not to call you out, but I'm sure when you walk into a <laughs> restaurant it's it's you're like I gotta sit down because everybody's looking at you because you're also like six ten, bro. <laughs> so t- just shout out <laughs> shout out to all the tall kings out there. But uh, but no, and also that being said, are too, you really six ten? No, I'm I'm in between say six six and six seven. He's he's a he's still, a, yeah. still no, tall. He's a unit. He's a unit. When I met him, I was like, dude, I just didn't expect that. I don't know. <laughs> that was the first thing he said. He just like, yeah. froze yeah. on Lorraine Looking Avenue in Cleveland. Yeah. There was this guy in uh, in Chicago that I met one time. His name's Luca. Shout out Luca. If he, I can't imagine why he'd listen, but he I I got introduced to Luca at a bar, and the first like I, it was like as if there was no filter, and I'm not really this type of person, but I was like. Come, I know you could pick me up. Yeah. Like I just knew it. Just the way he was built, I was like, "You are built for picking people up." Yeah, and uh, yeah, he, he he did it. He was he could do it. Um, See, yeah, and that is. I was actually just talking to someone. Uh, every time I go out somewhere, I absolutely wish I was five or six inches shorter. Because <laughs> after you get to a certain point in age, the only time height was ever useful was in athletics when I sure. was younger. It's, I don't need to be this tall in my 30s it doesn't do anything it does for you nothing, now yeah. it does nothing but negatives for me i mean it is you stand out everywhere you go it's just yeah i would well, absolutely I'm, love to be like six one it would be a dream well and i'm pointing out what i just did was the bad version of this but for some reason it's like as soon as you cross i don't know what is it six four maybe I mean, six four is the difference for some between reason, tall and people tall. just feel like they can come up and just talk to you about your body suddenly you know what i mean like i don't know why it's like a threshold i think it's because it's looked at as like a positive thing yeah they you know think I mean? it's flattering but it's like if i have a napkin on my lap i don't want to talk about whether or not i can dunk it's really yeah. uncomfortable and it's always it's feeling i feel like the things that people say to tall people too are so off kilter yeah if there's and they're always I mean it's like I ex- half expected it and then there was another half where I was just why did you think that that was acceptable <laughs> to just present to me yeah well it, on that note and I, I I'm sorry that I've somehow got us spinning on your height but there's, <laughs> there's something that I really love Timothy always tells me a story about his his you know super Italian grandpa from Italy. Mm -hmm. And apparently in Italy, there aren't that many like tall tall people. And Timothy always said when he'd be out in public, he couldn't help. He was just drawn to tall people. Oh, he, we, we'd find him on other sides of restaurants just chatting with somebody. You know what I mean? And he's like, whoa, whoa, partner. And then he'd just like walk over there and start, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he like had a really thick accent too. But it's like, yeah, it, it was like the most fascinating thing to, to him that he could, and just anybody, he, he would he would stop what we were doing. He'd pull over a car. He loved to look at and talk to a tall person. <laughs> that was fascinating. That is, you know what? I was in Italy last year and I noticed that. Yeah, I, really? you know, it's an anomaly apparently there. No, it, it, it really wasn't. 
there's definitely not a litany of tall people in Italy. <laughs> Were you <laughs> seen as a star? No. No. <laughs> You've got me really thinking about this now. I'm like, I think I actually did not take advantage of the situation. But yeah, yeah. bro. No, I would come home with all kinds of snacks. No, and, real, real modest experience for me personally. Yeah. But yeah. Well, uh, now that we've surpassed that, <laughs> Timothy, Timothy kind of prompted oh, yeah. me and I you was, with a question. I'm legitimately yeah. interested because I feel like Chase has told me maybe or somebody told me, but I can't remember what it is. How do you guys know I, each other? I know Bill and Bill, feel free to step in if I am incorrect in any of these, but you, you're good friends with Nico, who is one of my best friends in the world. Nico, love you to death, bro. College roommate. In fact, Nico and I met at the skate park, and within 45 minutes, we decided we were living together this next semester. <laughs> we when did you meet? College. We were just at the skate park um, in Kent. The way you described it, I would have <laughs> expected you were 10. <laughs> no, no. No, we were grown. We were probably yeah. 20. And we just dapped each other up, and, and we became homies. And then by the end of that, we had exchanged information so that we could live together next year. And so we did that. So Nico, Nico and I have been boys. Um, I moved out here post-college, and Nico kind of, I think he moved up to Lakewood. And anyway, Bill, at some point, you guys crossed paths, right? What, what would that have been? Yeah, we crossed paths through... I mean, the art scene in Cleveland is if you dabble in any realm of creativity, you're probably going to cross paths. So I want to say it was 2018 or 2019 that I met Nico. He actually came to one of my open studios here in Cleveland and checked out the clothes. And we hit it off from there. And then it just became, I mean, we were at the same place. And then even just small events, like when Vince from Sense was doing his pop-ups before he opened the sense restaurant i'd run into nico there we so we were just in mutual mm-hmm. places and i don't know he's he's one of the i mean one of if not the best guys i know it just he's it's hard not to be drawn to him as a person and yeah, yeah just super great guy every thing i've done through my brand i would say for the past three or four years nico's handled the branding completely yep, yep. so we have, I would say it's equal parts professional and personal relationship now because he, I trust him with anything that I do. And he also, like, he'll, he'll send me his latte art in the mornings. Like it's a, we also have like a very personal relationship. It's, oh, 100%. He's just, yeah. Yeah. And he's just so sincere about everything that he does. And yeah, just also top five personal styles from people I know. Just, super stylish too in his own way it's just yeah. everything he does is himself and you just gotta uh, love him you gotta yeah. love him great great dude yeah yeah so then and then on the subject of him doing design work for you i mean this would have been two years ago me and nico were kind of doing some studio work together we were kind of teaming up on branding projects this and that and then i came home i came home with my girlfriend to, I, I was going to show michelle in cleveland and ashabula and then me you, Nico, my mom, my sister, Michelle, like we all we all met to met up at Sense, which is the pizza spot, which one absolutely bangs. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So then I, I, I joked with Timothy. I was like, oh, no, bro. I know Bill. Like, he's met my mom. dude. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> mom, what's about, about Laura? <laughs> yeah, we're, we're boys now. He knows Laura by name. Yeah. So. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's about it, about it, bro. And then, you know, it. it between canoe club and all of that and then our friend connections and we've just kind of been again like you said with nico kind of existing in the same kind of world nico would always talk about you and then i became to know you and then obviously uh now you're you're here in canoe club so how long is how long you've been doing the brand then my first launch was august 2018 so we actually just had our five-year anniversary last week let's go baby hell yeah so, so we're how, like it's been, yeah yeah it was uh, it was so funny it was uh my season one debut was yeah august 10th 2018 in a shop in lakewood ohio we did a weekend pop-up so yeah. that was the beginning of it yeah and it same. literally didn't even look like the same brand as it does i had no idea what i was doing like, yeah. <laughs> just right. no idea i was yeah because I didn't go to school, I was self-taught, and that was just that was essentially like my freshman thesis collection. I mean, I had no idea how to even make clothes at the time, and I was trying to put something together. But yeah, Bill, yeah. Bill, were you sewing? Like, did you buy like a sewing machine and shit to like pattern out your own pieces, or or were you working with somebody that yeah, had the know-how? You, you know what I mean? If you don't mm-hmm. mind, like, touch on like how you got it started, because I think a lot of people ask yeah. about that. Like, they ask us about it, and it's like, truly, what does it look to like completely like? 
grassroots to, until in. yeah like to start it like how did you go about it yeah i would say all right we'll circle back a little bit so i've sketched since i was a little kid just mm-hmm. pencil paper old school route i would say i started sketching when i was six or seven originally was really into two completely separate worlds so i was really into armani suits as a kid and then i was really into sneakers Mm -hmm. So those would be the things I would sketch. I would sketch men in suits and then I would sketch sneakers, sometimes a direct sketch from East Bay or sketching my own original designs out since, and this was like 95, 96. So uh, wait wait a minute, just before you keep going though, Armani specifically, how did you like, how did you get, I mean, we've talked about it before, but like, you know, Chase from Ohio, I'm from Indiana originally. Like it's not like, it wasn't easy to like know about that kind of stuff at a younger age. You know what I mean? Because it just wasn't available. You didn't see it anywhere. I didn't see it on people really. I didn't see it in the stores. So like I'd have magazines and stuff, but there wasn't like that many men's magazines then. So you didn't really see menswear at all. So where did you like first see that? Or like, how did you seek that out? Yeah. So two ways. So I spent most of my days at my grandparents and my grandfather is, his name is William Frederick. So that's who the brand essentially honors. And he was always dressed very well, very uniform, but in a like no frills way. I mean, it was a button up tucked into slacks and just always presentable, but never really spent much on clothes. But he used to take me to, at the time it was Kaufman's and which later was bought by Macy's. But he used to take me and he would let me help him pick out his, he would buy like four or five dress shirts every year. And that was when it used to come in the plastic folding with the clips. Mm -hmm. And it was a very old school presentation of dress shirts in a department store. And so I got really into this idea of essentially curating his looks as a very young kid. And that was just what he did. He took me to the stores with him. And he was very selective. He didn't have much money. So that was just my first, I guess, experience styling. And then Mm -hmm. randomly, I was really into wrestling as a kid. And Vince McMahon went on some crazy spiel one night and he started talking about his thousand dollar Armani suits. And I heard that and it was just like Armani. And then that was like my singular focus of what a suit was. (laughs) So it was very random now. So good. So (laughs) sick though. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my, it was like East Bay's. I just just used to pile up East Bay's and we would trade them at school and everyone would kind of do that thing. And then I would take them to my grandparents with me and just study East Bay front to back. Of course. And also every catalog, whether it be Macy's, I mean, J.C. Penney at the time, Sears, like all of those classic you know, Midwestern mall stores and just study everything from ties to dress shirts to blazers. Oh, yeah. to suit. And that and that really all it was. And sometimes it would start with a, a sketch of those or tracing those. And then I would start to build out my own wardrobes. It was like I didn't really have much to do because I was an only child at my grandparents. So it was just that's Sick, yeah, yeah. that was my outlet. No, I feel that I was raised in a J.C. Penney's, bro. That was. Yeah, that was, that was like that was kind of like. Do you remember Zones, Z O N Z, and Jinko? No. Jink, like Jinko, like J N C O. Yeah, the enormous. Oh, of jeans. course, brother. Yeah, 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 enormous yeah, yeah. jeans. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Every, everyone wore Zones with that. So Zones, Z O N Z, was a metallic short sleeve shirt with a zip up halfway, and uh, that was the pairing. So there was also like a skate influence on what I was doing, and then I played basketball my whole life, so like every that was the time for sneakers obviously to grow up and then see ever see all those shoes in east bay and then wait in line at Foot Locker as a kid on the new jordan release or the pennies or griffies so that was i just was in a lot of different worlds at once and started just pulling from that so i mean i sketched from that time into my late 20s and i just i was approaching 30 i was 29 and I was like, my life has borderline no purpose right now. I'm I'm just going through the motions, clocking in, clocking out, living corporate life. And at the same time, I had bundles of sketchbooks with my current designs as an adult at that time. And friends found it. I hid it. I like I hid these things like they were dirty mags or something. And sure. Because I just didn't want anyone to even ask about it or think. I had a creative bone in my body at the time. So friends found it though. And they were like, this is all incredible. Why aren't you pursuing this? And and I just brushed it off for a long time. And then eventually I was like, okay, 
so we did like a little a group project where we picked the best piece in my two sketchbooks and we picked a top coat and then I was like, okay, I'm going to go make it. And then I found a pattern maker here in Cleveland to make the pattern that I had for an idea. And we were just sampling and playing around. And this is now late 2016 at this time. I'm 29, late 2016. And then I finally get this one sample made. And for whatever reason, my brain is, like, well, New York Fashion Week is coming up and I've never went. And I had no access to any of the shows or anything. So it's like, I'm just going to go. I was like, it's a good yeah. time to, this will be the perfect litmus test if people even notice what I'm wearing. So I go, I eventually got into shows. I mean, you, they're absolutely looking for seat fillers for a lot of the younger designers that are on the calendar because the worst thing in the world is to have empty seats. So I would just sometimes be able to enter the building and get put in a seat. And through that, I just started networking, which for me isn't natural at all because I'm pretty shy, pretty quiet. But in that moment, I was like, I need to know this for myself. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would then I went in every single store that sold men clothes in Manhattan, in and out, in and out. And I started getting stopped on a pretty regular basis with questions about where is that coat from? Who made that coat? And then over time, I got used to saying I did. And that moment in New York in February of 2017 gave me the confidence to pursue it and start building out other pieces and patterning and making small capsule ideas in my head. And that was really what prompted me to get into it. But to answer your question, no, I don't sew or pattern make. I'm pretty much designer, creative director. And then we have a production manager here that I've worked with for almost five years now. Who knows? We speak the exact same language. It's dream relationship for me. I don't take it for granted any day. And it's, yeah. And without her, my brand wouldn't exist. So, I mean, I always want to give her even more credit than me. She brings everything that I dream up to life. So let's go. So on, on that, on that note, you touched on it and I talk about it all the time. I, I fucking love Cleveland. I think one of the most exciting things for me at Canoe Club was like when William Frederick got here, came to mm -hmm. fruition. We, we we carried the brand and it's like, no, that's from fucking Cleveland. That's my boy. That's made <laughs> in Cleveland. He designs it in Cleveland, packed it up in Cleveland and it got here. Like, I, I so I, I love that. Clearly you. OK, so you went to New York. You know that most f most manufacturing is done either in, you know, Los Angeles outside of Los Angeles or New York City when it, it, for the most part in the US you obviously could outsource elsewhere mm -hmm. you chose to keep it in Cleveland why I would say so I grew up in a very very small town and at the time when I was growing up in the 90s I had firsthand experience of mom and pop shops that you know every seemed like every other business had someone's first name attached to it or their last name mm -hmm. and that always resonated with me and you know, by the time I graduated high school, graduated college, looking back at my own hometown and seeing all of those stores, you know, essentially the recession era of 2008 or so has really did a number on a lot of the mom and pop stores across the Midwest. And just looking at that and craving that and being in Cleveland, which isn't that, that it's a much larger city than I grew up in. But at the same time, it's still a small enough city that you can make an impact relatively quick. Real, real fast, Bill, what 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 small town is it still Ohio? Yeah, I grew up in Wellsville. Okay. Like populations, it, I think, approaching 3,000. Okay, so it's small, small, yeah, yeah. Very, very small. I grew up right on the Ohio River where West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania all meet. So I have a little bit of a oh. Western PA accent. But I spent most of my weekends as a kid in Pittsburgh. Okay. So I had that experience and everything. You know, where I grew up is super blue collar. Everything is... Mm -hmm. like it's Appalachia, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's like Steel Town, Pottery you know, coal. It was all of those yeah. lunch pail, brown bag type of industry things. Of course. Okay. Interesting. So, so small town. Yeah. And then obviously you, you've chosen to keep the manufacturing in Cleveland. And mm -hmm. also one of the things that I always shout out is I'll be like, it's really cool, you know, and did you just move into the studio? How long have you been in the studio? I was in the studio from 2018 to 2020. I was out for a year during COVID, came back late 2021. So Okay, cool. Yeah, but I've been in, in here looking the way it looks, essentially my little showroom shop, coffee shop 
studio yeah. type deal has been a thing since late 2021. Yeah. Okay, sick. Yeah, that, I, I, I kind of remember when that all... Mm-hmm. Yeah, but to answer your question, you know, to circle back about why keep it here is there's also, I mean, there's admittedly a selfish aspect to it because I am, when it comes to quality, I am very dialed in and to be able to do my own QC in the same building as my Mm -hmm. studio to be hands-on, to also have the first name basis with the people making my clothes on both sides of that coin and to be able to develop those relationships and know that I care about them. They care about me. That translates to the product being made. It's just, it's so much easier for me too. So it's, I definitely don't want to come across as this person who's, kind of wearing the cape and trying to make things in Cleveland. It absolutely is something that it benefits me just as much as it benefits anyone here. So, well, I, I think it's one of the coolest parts of the story, dude. Like you said, like that you can walk, it's all maintained in the same building, designed, cut, sewn, checked for quality, styled this, that, and the other. I, that That's like the selling point. It's what I always tell mm-hmm. people like, man, it's really cool. He's got this, you know, it's this really cool, you know, textured ass walls seems like an older building. I've never been, um, but I just love that man. Uh, is, is there any disadvantages to it though? Like, is like yeah. is being that close to it difficult ever, or does it only ever make sense to you? The proximity is never difficult for me. It may be difficult for the factory though, because yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, <laughs> yeah. the, the guy yeah. who cares so much about every little detail of every product being made right above you is yeah. probably. Yeah maybe anxiety inducing sometimes yeah. <laughs> sure sure <laughs> but i would yeah i mean the dis i mean i don't really even see it as a disadvantage but I, you talk about the bottom line like it's not cheap <laughs> it's it's expensive yeah to mm-hmm. do it here totally. it's way more expensive here to make clothes than it is in la or i mean you're because everything is so small badge like for me you know when i send a t-shirt to you or colbo the other store i'm in and that sells that's great i'm not making i mean there's products that i'm releasing and selling that when they go the wholesale route or to a store, I'm not making money because you have to pay a certain amount of money to do small batch production for the hourly rate and wages of the people in the factory. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I I don't think people really grasp just how expensive it is for me to make anything because there's just no cheap product for me to make. Even a t-shirt is, you know, the quantities I'm doing just cut and sew is around $15 per T just for me to cut. So, oh, interesting. Tea. So, I mean, you think about margins and then the fabrics I'm using at that point are relatively expensive hemp and organic cotton blends. I mean, it gets, so there's definitely some elements to it. If you're talking just being honest and not presented as a disadvantage, but the reality of it is, you know, I'm paying more, but I want people who spend time making my products to be paid well. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's just like, that's part of my ethos in general too, is, you know, I, I would not be comfortable popping in and saying hi all the time to people who weren't being paid fairly to make the product that I then retail for two, three, up to $700. It just, I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I was doing that. Yeah. I, there's this, I think there's this idea, especially in fashion that like, we're, because the item is expensive, that there's this like huge markup. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's like that's just not the case with almost anything that we carry. Like, it's like you're paying for the fact that like what you just said is happening in a lot of the factories of the things we carry. Like people know the people working in them. They're being paid well. There is a lot of attention being paid. The fabrics are expensive and difficult to source. And people like you're paying for the care and level of attention to detail. And I don't think people always understand to what extent, but the extent is high. (laughs) I can tell you as it's a, as it's difficult to be in this industry in the sense that like, I think it's just, everyone thinks that like, there's this like, uh, this old school mentality of fashion where it's like super like, you know, uh, high end luxury, you know, there's all this money and there's, and there, there probably is in a lot of things, but when it comes to this sort of like, this type of stuff, this like kind of supporting artists kind of thing, which I think is a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. There's not boatloads of cash in it. I mean, there's, there's money, but it's not, it's not what I think people think it is. It's not the, like the luxury thing that I, you know, I think it's just because 
they're like, well, it's a thousand dollar coat. So how much money are you making? And it's like, not as much as you'd think, you know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. just, it's just, it yeah. costs that much because of the labor and fabric. I mean, it, the, the money's in the jacket, you know what I mean? So it's, it's, it's interesting yeah. how it's almost like you feel like you have to defend it sometimes where it's like, no, man, it's just not that, <laughs> it's just not as like lucrative as you've got it in your head. as uh-huh. being. Yeah. Well, yeah, you have to imagine all the hands yeah. that touched it and it's yeah, crazy. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like, you think about, I always try to tell people because, I mean, I, you know, I've, when I first started out, I was doing the pop up scene and the markets and the craft things that you do when you're an independent company in Cleveland trying to get your name out there. And I mean, I, I had to exit that for my own <laughs> well being because I would leave those, th- I would leave so angry every time because, you know, when people come up and look at your product at a, at a flea market or something and then they look at the price tag and they scoff and they walk away and that's the end of that transaction and I'm just yeah. absorbing that over and over again <laughs> without yeah. being able to be, no, here is why. <laughs> and I try to get people to think about it. Even, you know, my tees are $85. They should be a lot more based on the cost to make those. But at the same time, I like to have something that is at least relatively an entry level price point just so people can get familiar with the brand. You know, it's, I'm not making much on a t-shirt sale, but at the same time, I'm banking on that t-shirt sale leading to someone buying my cafe jacket, buying my top coat down the line. So it's trying, I'm almost presenting those items as long-term gateway pieces where and I tell people when they, because I get questioned on that price point for a T-shirt in Cleveland all the time, and I try to walk them through it. Like, think about yourself down there, rolling out a piece of fabric, cutting it, <laughs> constructing it. Like, how much would you want paid to make one T-shirt? And people really don't have a, and that's not. I don't know if that's the best example, but people usually don't even have a number in mind because you're not going to do that for five dollars. You're not going to do that for ten dollars. It takes so much time to do that. And when I have those moments in my studio that are one on one or a group of three or four, and I have that time to educate and not in a pretentious or arrogant way, just like, hey, Mm -hmm. maybe look at it with yourself in that position. And now go all the way to that point and now start thinking about what it actually takes just to make something as simple as a T-shirt and what it should cost. Sure, sure. Well, and it's just, it's so, I don't know why this annoys me so much, but the, but like, it's just like, nobody ever questions, you know, somebody rolling out a canvas and then painting with you know, paint that costs nothing. And I understand that there's a skill and a talent that goes into it. And then you look at it and they're like, I don't know, a million dollars. And people are like, well, it's art. You know what I mean? It's like, mm-hmm. I don't understand why is that so different than what people do with clothing? You know what I mean? People obviously treat clothing like art. To, some people do. But for some reason, it's like also because everyone has to participate in it, where not everyone has to participate in owning art. It feels like people are able to separate the fact that like, yeah, there's T-shirts you can go buy that are, yeah, functional, you know, regular ass, you know, cheap T-shirts. Or there is what you're doing, which is taking a, I'm making a lot of decisions, paying people the right amount to make it like, you know, making sure it drapes and fits the way you want it to fit, which is, you know, somebody's thinking, you know, I mean, it, that at that point, it becomes art to me because of the intention. And it's just, and, it, and for some reason, it just drives me so crazy that it's like, well, I don't understand why one, which is an insane markup is okay with people. And that's okay to digest. And then mm-hmm. one feels like so separate, like it, where it's like, like people scoff at the price where you're like, well, come on, you don't even, you don't even have an interest in like, maybe that's, maybe that's expensive for you. And I respect that different price points are for different people. Mm-hmm. And you know, what's your interest level is or knowledge or whatever it is. Um, but at the same time, like, aren't you interested in why it does? You doesn't mean you have to buy it, but it's just like right. it's like the 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 taking offense to it is a little crazy to me. Yeah, it's interesting to me that people place higher values on things that they don't necessarily understand. Yeah, you know, yeah, when yeah, you're yeah. when you're going to art, it's it's. I mean, you, you've I think we've all been to some sort of gallery showcase, even if it's on a like ground level of like young artists or something. It's like the mm-hmm. way people approach art as a conversation. And it's like, if you don't understand it, maybe that means it's worth more than I can comprehend. And then they start placing the, there's no real market value for it for, and within, you know, there is a market value for it, but with a lot of things, it just seems to be an open market. Whereas with clothing, it's like, it's pretty understood. You're going to put this on your body. You're going to button it up. You're going to put these on your legs. And 
for me, it's just weird that function and almost, I mean, you said to to participate in society, you need to get dressed. So the fact that it is like a re daily requirement, you would think it would have a greater value than it does. It's interesting. I mean, this is, that's a whole rabbit hole to go. Down. Yeah. I think the main thing we touched on when, when I look at it is just like, again, anybody can go to Walmart and buy a t-shirt for four dollars and 65 cents and i and i just think that's the baseline for most people who aren't seeking out this world intentionally or you know what i mean like for most people especially where we're from carhartt is the nicest thing you can buy and why would you fuck around with something else you know what i mean like mm -hmm. that that has a value that is they've already accepted the the price for the item you're getting and anything else just seems silly because why do you need something else? Carhartt's going to do a good job and it costs X amount of money. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. the accessibility of everything else. So if you don't understand this world, it's like, well, that's stupid. Why would I pay 85 bucks for a t-shirt? I can get a dozen of them. Yeah. And, they and it, go on my yeah. body the same way. And, yeah. And I think it puts me in a position sometimes where I don't necessarily feel guilty, but I'm a little bit unsure of how to tackle it because, okay, let's use an example here. Everyone swears by Dickies pants, right? And mm -hmm. especially where I'm from, those pants cost you know twenty, twenty five, thirty dollars, right? And it's hard for me to watch that be celebrated because they last a long time. Because I know what the people are getting paid to make those pants, mm -hmm. yeah. and to me, if a pair of pants lasts forever, but someone suffered to make them, I don't think that that's really a point of pride. I mean, it's, and it's kind of like, I feel like I, I want people to be able to say, okay, these pants cost $20. That's concerning. Yeah. So, I like, mean, that, well, should, that should be the yeah. conversation that's had. It's yeah. Like, well, it's that like, but I don't want to be sense. the guy who has it. You know, you don't want to, <laughs> you look a little bit bitter and you look like, ah, he's not, you know, he's no fun. He just wants to talk about fair wages and labor rights and stuff. So it's like, <laughs> well, I also you... respect that like people need people that aren't getting paid as much need to need a pair of work pants that is going to last a long, long time that is not going to break the bank when you're not making that much to do whatever job you're doing. Like yeah. that's not that that's, that's tough too. It's like, capitalism alone is like driven it down to the point where mm -hmm. it's like man shit it's like it's a chicken or the egg kind of thing it's yeah, like i don't know fair, you know fair. what i mean it's like i want those people to be able to afford that thing i want also for people to value things a little bit differently but it's like you, it's like it's hard to have both you know it's, yeah, it's a tough yeah. it's a tough predicament to be in it's super um, complicated and i and i that's where it gets because i don't want to offend anyone and i also am very aware like based on where i grew up that's commonplace that someone cannot sure. afford something that costs more than 20 or $30. So it's just me. I, it's a constant internal battle more so than an external battle. It's just something I've, I'm constantly navigating. The, how do you balance that? Because yeah, I mean, there are a lot of clothes that are too expensive too. And you know that you're, I mean, not in your world and our world that we operate in per se, but there's, you know, when you get into a certain level of fashion and clothing it definitely is very overpriced compared to the cost to produce or cost to make and yeah, yeah it's i mean you could go on forever about this so what is your like what is if you could kind of just because you're in a unique situation could you walk us through and like what what does your team and like operations look like how like is it a is it is there like how many people approximately would you say are actually like working on clothes and like is your team for William Frederick specifically, is that just you? So is it just you and like one other person or is there, how, how big are we looking at here? Yeah. So for William Frederick, we'll start there. I just hired my first employee June 1st. So it's Sick. me and one other person. Nice. And that was a Kent State graduate. Her name's Lily. Shout out. Yeah. So I, and Lily. then the, <laughs> the factory where the clothes are made has three employees. It has a production manager, an assistant production manager, a seller and then but all three of them do so so all three are hands-on so Sick, yeah yeah i mean less than five <laughs> it's, That's because the, the the person that i hired in june is in a hybrid role so they work for my brand two days a week and then the factory hired them for part-time mm. for three days a week. So, you know, it's four people all in the same building every day. Wow. That That's the output. It, up until June 1st, it was exclusively me handling every element of the brand. And I still have a nine to five too. So that's why I, was, I have to get someone else in to help me at this point because yeah. the brand is finally 
you know, obviously with your help and Colbo and just the nature of the brand evolving and becoming more well-known and respected and trusted, I think is another key factor mm -hmm. there. Yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, when I'm logged in to a computer nine to five and I can't really work on clothes any day until it gets to the evening, that is, it was just becoming too much. I was, I yeah. was way too thin and, and I've started to branch out too. even with fall winter campaign. I hired a stylist and a creative director for that because I was looking, I was just self-evaluating everything and the styling for myself is pretty strong, but it's also, there's a, there's a level it could go to that I personally can't unlock. So I had to let that go and hire the person. Her name's Dion. I think she's maybe the premier stylist in the industry. And I was able to you know, convince her to work with me and I'm very excited about that. And it's just those little things, you know, I think when I was starting the brand, I was, you know, you have insecurities when you're entering this world as someone who's never even studied it. And with that comes some pride, some ego, some misplaced control. And to be able, that's my biggest growth has been able to evolve out of that. And as I become a more confident designer and secure in what I'm doing and the way my brand resonates with others and the language that the clothing speaks, I think being able to then say, okay, these are all of the things that someone else somewhere can do better than me. And I'm going to put my trust in these people because otherwise I'm just going to be stagnant or I won't reach the full potential. So that, that's that been definitely a learning curve of having a young brand and kind of oh, looking sure. myself in I the mean, mirror. I mean, I think that's that, that reality is that's any business. Uh, I was, I was as, just going to say, Timothy, you, grow you have something. to experience this too, you of know? Of course. I mean, like that's the, a lot of the most difficult things, but the most correct decisions ever made were to go, this is no longer the best use of my time and it's outside my skill level. And now my job primarily would be to make sure to communicate what the goals are of what I've decided the goals are for the business and what I've decided the goals are for, um, creative or whatever it is. And mm -hmm. they might be, and the better you are at that, the less you do, you know what I mean? That's, that's the reality. Like the better you are at communicating what the goals and the vision is, then if, if I do that well, then I talk to creative one time and let them do whatever they need to do. And that's pretty much how they operate. I mean, I pretty much yeah. say, here's this, here's how I'd like to see it styled. I, I have like this picture in mind or here's kind of my reference point. And then I go, I'll see that when it's done. You know what I mean? And then, Absolutely. but that, but that did not, that I took every single picture when we first opened product photos, details, uh, any sort of lookbook, styled looks, anything like that, everything for the website. I took 100% of those photos and I barely knew how to use a camera. It was just like, a, that's yeah. who needed to do it. That's who was available to do it. I had an, you know, an okay eye for doing that thing because I'd done something, you know, some stuff like it before, but it wasn't, it, it was, it became, you know, unsustainable by year one, basically, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like, and it was just like, this is not, this is not where I should be using my time and efforts and someone else is going to do this better than me. And I, but that's really hard to do when you want your name on everything. You know what I mean? Or you feel obligated to have your name on everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And actually I have a question for you then, and you, yeah. I can answer it too, but I was curious, the thing that keeps me up at night, even still, and now I'm chipping away at it, but it's when I have this very specific visual or idea and I just can't execute it yet. And the gap has narrowed between the execution and the ideas now that's starting to become like, I'm actually able to execute those. But I mean, that's the thing when I felt like my, like my taste level and my understanding of things and my sensibilities when it comes to design or aesthetics was so much stronger than what I was creating. That was such a difficult period for me. And I'm imagining you had some similar experiences doing what you were doing. I think anyone who's good at this, the answer should be that never, you never completely close the gap. I mean, I say mm -hmm. that half of my job is failing as little as I possibly can, but it's never, I'm never out of the hole. You know what I mean? Because in my mind, I mean, there's a healthy, there's, a, there's, there's healthy <laughs> elements of this versus unhealthy. And I've been yeah. on both sides of those things transparently. But I think that like, my goal is that it always gets better. If it's not better then you know what I mean? Like I always say to the team in a dream world, we would be embarrassed by everything we did a year before. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like, and, and, and I mean that sincerely, like I want you to do the best you can today and be proud of everything you did. 
but also constantly see opportunities for improvement because it's just, it makes you better as a person. It makes you better as a business. It makes it because it's, it's because you personally want to get better, not the business. It's not about money at that point. It's about, I want to get better. I want to see it better. I have it in my head the way it looks. I mean, again, trying to be like vulnerable. Like I have like thoughts of like, I know the article I want to read about canoe club one day. Like I know what I'd want it to say, but we're not there yet. We have not made enough of an impact yet. You know what I mean? We haven't, we're not, we haven't executed every single idea I want to. And some ideas, I don't know how to execute or if we can, or, but I've also said that prior to executing other things that worked out great. So it's like, I think that the, the God's honest is that no matter, every time you get like one door begets another door opening begets another begets another. So like every time that you think you've got like you, everything you've narrowed that gap, like you're saying the, I, that allows whenever I've narrowed the gap that allows the, the a new idea to get bigger. Mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm, I have to mm-hmm. close that again. You know what I mean? Yeah. So realistically the goal is just keep it as narrow as possible, but the, you should, there should, the gap should always be, there should always be a gap. I think, I think that's, that's the key. Yeah. It's actually just jotting down and you made me think of something. So that's, I have a follow up question then. So as long as that gap exists, you're essentially maybe saying that your taste and your ideas and your understanding of things is a little bit better than the actual result. Do you think if any point that result then exceeds your taste, that then the gap kind of gets abolished that you're operating on luck at that point, and then you could lose your mm. brand identity? Does that I kind think, of like a just give and take there? I'm just curious what you think. I think that... I mean, that's tough. I mean, because, I, you know, you see brands where it's like you kind of start to see them lock it in where you're like, oh, I've I've seen I don't want to call it any names here, but I can tell like there's one I have in mind where it's like I saw it go from so small and then grew and then grew bigger and bigger and bigger. And you start to be like, oh, man, they've nailed it. They, they The shoots look exactly as they should. It is ex- like they are executing exactly the idea I know they're going for here. And I think sometimes when you think like, oh, cool, it's on lock, I think what happens is the person that should be most focused on pushing creative and pushing uh, the ability to get better and change and be different in a way that makes sense for your brand, I think that person gets too distracted and then things start. that's when things start to go haywire because I think also having something on lock for too long you will lose as many people on it as if you tried an idea that didn't work because at a certain point you start to lose people's attention when it's just the same all the time. Because even if you are a household name, you're just like, they make Ziploc bags and they make good Ziploc bags. But if no one ever like pushed that beyond just that blue and green sticky thing and changed it to, you know, the thing that zips across, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I, not a great example, but, but like if no one ever put that, it didn't need to get pushed. It was doing the thing it was going to yeah, do, yeah. but they pushed it one step further and then that'll push it one step further. And now that can go in a freezer. Now it can, you know, yeah, it's the same true. shit. It's like at some point, I think as you, when you start to feel like you got it on lock, then I think you got to look at yourself and go, how can I continue to push myself and be thinking like a big picture? Like what is, what is getting in the way of me coming up with new ideas? Like I've had to, I have a really, uh, tra- like again, transparently, like I have a, I have a, a struggle and I like to work in the minutia a lot. Like I really love to pack boxes. I love Reorganize to be involved the shelves. Yeah. I really yeah. like to do it. And I do think, and I, Chase will back me up on this cause he, cause he knows I'm right. I'm very good at it. Like yeah. I like doing it because I like doing it my way and coming up with a new idea on this is how we'll organize this shelf and that'll be the best yeah, op- yeah. Mm-hmm. optimization. I like to sit. optimize it, but I also have to like understand that that used to be the way where I'd like blow off steam is doing things like that. And now I've noticed I really have to stop. I have to step completely away. Yeah. I have to allow myself to take walks, take hikes, just spend time not looking at it as wasting time when I'm looking around on Instagram at other things going on or magazines or books or whatever documentaries, whatever I'm doing that's like trying to further my knowledge of the thing. Um, because that's the times when I find something little that unlocks, you know, it, it loosens the screws just enough for me to look inside and it's like, Oh cool. Now I have all these new ideas on how we can, how it can be bigger and it lets you focus on the like bigger picture stuff. Like, you know, we say, we talk about community a lot and sometimes I have to step back far enough where I can go, what is, what do I mean when I say community? Like you have to like really Mm -hmm. dissect everything so that you can know how better to serve that thing rather than get so focused on the minutia of like, I just need to keep posting on discord style form, whatever it is. Like, cause that, that's how I'm activating community. And I'm like, maybe, but it's maybe you're not optimizing it in the right way. And I mean, like you, you have to just keep 
zooming out and zooming out and zooming out that that mm-hmm. in my opinion that that's the only thing that's worked for me is like every single time I don't think I can zoom out further like I'm thinking at a high level I don't think it's true I mean that's why I think you get a lot of these like huge CEOs like um like uh like Steve Jobs or something who are on another like they're trying to like astral project at a certain point you know what I mean because it's like they they're trying to be that far away f- like uh, change their thinking that much because that's the only way where you can really come up with really strong new ideas and push the boundaries and stuff like that as long as you've set up a good like ethos and like you know like so you're not getting too far away from it at the same time it's it's I mean I know I'm not I'm not giving you a direct answer I think but I think that that's no one's got it unlocked you know what I mean like it's it's, yeah. it's always you're you're kind of always walking this really thin balance beam of like Am I too involved? Am I not involved enough? Am I, you know what I mean? Like what, am, what, how am I best serving the business? But I think that's really it. As long as you're, that's the constant line of thinking is how can I best serve the business? Me personally, like my brain and no, and, and hoping that you have something that everyone else needs and knowing that everyone that works with you, they also have something you really need. That's, that's the key. I mean, it's just, it's just knowing what, and finding what those things are and allowing it to grow and evolve. Cause I think people like lock things in a certain way and that's when you get fucked up. You well, know what I, I mean, I think there's, I think the appeal is, all right, this is figured out autopilot. Now I can focus on this other thing while this just takes care of itself. But like you're saying is it doesn't necessarily lend itself that way. Like you said, you kind of, it gets stale. It can get boring, it can get stale. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I actually, <laughs> I'm I'm asking you too many questions now, but <laughs> do you have, when you're creating, because I feel like Canoe has such a cohesive and approachable identity across the board, not just in the way you operate on Discord style form, but also the way you shoot your product, the way your website looks, the way you navigate it, the way the, the selection of brands that you have. Do you have, you know, pillars or keywords that you think of every time like I want to communicate this specifically because for me for example I have three words that are my pillars for everything I do they have to meet those if they don't they get scrapped from whatever I'm doing so I was just curious on that if you have not necessarily a mood board but almost almost like a word board where these are our values and these will be communicated in everything that we do I think where you're at right now with like the age of your brand and like what you're trying to accomplish, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing some things, but are, are making assumptions, but, um, I think that's a perfect way to operate. Now you have to remember, we have two slightly different things. We're a multi-brand retailer. It's complicated because you're representing, you're trying to best represent a lot of different brands visions, um, in a way where you still have your own point of view. So ours is, complicated in that way i I was just gonna say also where we're at i try to i try to really put forth like how does a thing make me feel like if i'm Mm -hmm. i just try to my for the best of me i try to pretend like canoe club is not a logo i saw born not anything that i visit daily you know what i mean which is all not untrue but i try to like just take a moment and go i'm a guy at home i'm really into this brand and i'm seeing this thing for the first time like does it feel like that brand or does it feel like like let's just say i I take a picture of double rl did i make it feel like the way double rl views their brand or did i go here's double rl i respect what they do but i also have been able i'm also putting my take on it like how what i would do slightly differently like the way i view it through my lens because i think that's what's interesting about relationships with retailers is it's i it's a big trust thing and i also want to make sure we're representing it in a way that stays true to what you're doing, but also is seen through the lens of what we're doing. Cause we have a customer that's coming to us for a specific reason. So really it's like where I'm at now is it's, it's a feeling it's, it's like, is it making me feel the way I want it to make me feel? So I know, mm-hmm. again, I know that that's pretty like, I don't want it to be like too new agey or something like that. It's just, but it's just, it's really that I, I don't, there's things for our brand and those that's more business decisions. I use like, does this fit these, like these uh, key like like ethos that we have for the for the brand, but that that really is more business related for us at yeah, that point. Yeah, completely. Could, um, and then the, everything else is it's really like kind of it's like a gut check. It's like how does that make me feel when I look at it or when mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. when I like digest it. Um, and and then I just try to think of I try to think of that definitely through the lens of the customer. But I, but like I said, it I don't want it to just I don't want it to make you feel like you want to buy it. I want it to make you feel excited about something or, or makes you like look at something a different way. Like when I double is like a perfect example of like, sometimes I just want people to look at it and go, it doesn't just have to be, I wear, 
I mean, it's, some people love that. You know, I mean, like they want it to be like not not a costume, but they want to wear like the double RL. They want to live that lifestyle that double RL has put mm-hmm. forth. And and in some ways, I just need to be really good about taking beautiful product photos that live on the website. And for that guy, they were looking for that piece, and they were able to find that piece and or come into the store and try it on or whatever it is. So it's like a service job, which is also important. But the other job I have is, in my opinion, would be that someone comes in and goes. I'm not a double RL guy, but man, I fuck with the way that they put that together. You know what I mean? Like I, that, that I, I get this now. And like, that's, that's, it's like kind of changing people's minds is another big mm-hmm. aspect of it or, or be yeah. feeling comfortable and safe enough to try different things or ask certain questions. You know what I mean? So again, it just really comes down to the way I want people to feel when they shop with us or talk to us. Yeah. That makes complete sense. I was just curious because when I got to, uh, let's say year three, year four, I felt like I had to establish those pillars for me personally because I admittedly was getting way too tired of being compared to other specific brands over and over again. And it was like, okay, they're not completely wrong. I don't agree with necessarily the comparison, but that just told me I wasn't doing enough to isolate myself in my own lane. And then once I started doing that, I think if you look at my content and my videos and my photos, let's say over the past 12 to 18 months, I've finally really like the identity of the brand is really strong. The imagery is borderline cinematic because that's where I take all of my inspiration from as film anyways. So I think with that, it really helped me start to carve out, which I'm still doing. I'm in the process of still carving out my own identity, my own lane, my own place in the market. But I was just, yeah, I, I've definitely found that to be so helpful for myself to have that. And then you, you touch on it a little bit, but I think as a designer and a store, you know, from you're juggling multiple worlds where sure. I'm trying to, with my imagery and my content and the way I share that create a world. And then the clothing is almost secondhand to that. And it is what I'm adding to that world. And once I started to take that focus, okay, we're creating a world and then we're creating what we add to the world. That's when I felt like my brand really started to fall into place. And now things are starting to happen for me that they weren't prior. 100%. I mean, I think that when I also say like feel things, what I try to think about is like what you're describing that you got to is being able to like, it's kind of like playing in the pocket when you play with, in, with with like music. Like you get into these zones or like with groups of people where like Chase and I call it dumb talk because we're able to talk to each other and go, oh, yeah, 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 do, yeah, like that. Like, but we're not really saying any words, but we understand mm-hmm, each other. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like that's what I'm always trying to get to with anything I do to where I'm able to just do the thing without it feeling like there's a – stress point between me and the thing I'm trying to accomplish. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's almost like what you're saying. Like once you get certain things figured out and creating like certain ethos or whatever to like make sure you don't, you're able to try new things without straying too far from what your goals are. I think that's brilliant. You should definitely do that. But at the same time, you should allow yourself, allow, allow yourself leniency to be like, I don't, I, I have to assume that like others, like sometimes what I'm into or what I'm doing, it changes. It's kind of constantly evolving. And I want to feel like I'm constantly evolving for the customer because they're constantly evolving. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And that's, I think as long as like finding that happy medium of like, I'm going to keep pushing this forward. And my whole goal is like to where I'm just like effortlessly creating and putting things out there without overthinking or feeling stress points that's when you're like when you're playing in the pocket like that that's when that's when a brand goes from good to great you know what i mean when it's like mm-hmm. oh this is them doing their truest thing like this is what they would be doing whether they were making a shit ton of money doing or they're making no money doing this this they want this to exist and they've allowed it to exist and i always believe in like the connection like people are going to connect to it that you're going to find your people if you if you're if you're authentically putting yourself out there i think when people fail is when they go i'm trying to reach this particular customer and i'm not that customer but i believe they're there and i can make money yeah. off of selling this, this thing to them that's when it doesn't work because you're not creating something that you want and i just i don't know what it is if it's spiritual or something, but I just feel like people know when that's, when that's not the case now more than ever, like authenticity is like the most important thing that you could put forth, whether you're saying that out loud, you know what I mean? And what you do, or you're doing, or you're making an assumption that the customer is going to pick up on it. But I think either way they pick up on it. Yeah, absolutely. So Chase, are you, when you when the looks go online and you're modeling, are you styling those yourself? 
out of curiosity? Is it team effort? Or what is your the, role in that? For the most part, me and Timothy, I think we both style things together. It depends on what it is. I yeah, mean, he, and who we're shooting on and stuff too. That's tricky in that, like, there's obvious things that I know that like Chase is going to be able to put together for himself and I'll feel probably com- I'll, like if we. I'm gonna I'm gonna style out engineered garments, whether it's on myself or somebody else. Typically, I'm gonna be like Timbo. I think this th- this it's, that and the other. This yeah. is this is what I want to do. I think the right. proportions are gonna play. When it comes to styling for us, I just know that like the main thing we always drive home. It's tricky because it's a business at the same time. You understand? Like, I, I have to like we have to be like, well, we got these three jackets in, and we definitely. Gotta want to have show one of these in a look and we definitely yeah. this should be in there because we have a lot of it i mean you have to make business decisions like that which isn't always perfect but you have to mm-hmm. um after that we pull like i think this is the vibe we're going th- yeah. for yeah. or like these are the proportions we want to make this piece look the best and then we start then i really defer to who's wearing it because if somebody does not feel comfortable in what they're wearing even if they you know have perfect proportion mm-hmm. look fucking great Shows in anything them how they're going to feel in it is going to show every single time. So we style it kind of, and then I always yeah. tell models freak it. What would you do now? Yeah. Like, wh- mm-hmm. how would you wear it? What would you, would you cuff the pants? Would you not like, I want them and it's not always the right decision, but s- off, more often than not, you're talking about little changes that make them feel like they can wear the thing correctly. And that the, the confidence, confidence shows. shows exactly. It also, we had a conversation, Timothy and I and Abby and the whole team, I would say, a year and a half ago. And what we try to do with styling in particular, when we're putting out new looks and whether it's a brand we've just recently picked up or someone we've had is we try to not go by, well, how would they style it? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like if we get a new brand in, we maybe we're showcasing a, a kit, you know, it's a pair of pants and a jacket and, and it goes well, but like we're not against pulling something else from another brand that mm-hmm. would up it proportionally or this texture of this, or slow jacket would look super sick over top, whatever it is. You know what I mean? And we're always trying to style it through the lens of like canoe club first and then kind of call on the cues that the brand either has or that the garment lends to. But trying to make it look like we styled it is also intentional. Yeah, completely. And I just want to say, when I saw the content that you put together with my clothing, it was such a pleasant surprise because it's absolutely not the way I would have styled it. Yeah, yeah. And it was so refreshing to see you you gave my clothes new life. And I really appreciated that because you handled it with such care. And, you know, as a new brand like myself, that can be, I, I'm not sure the best way to put it, but it, I mean taking it into your world with your eyes and your vision meant a lot to me. And it definitely, I think obviously helped resonate with your customer base too. So it was just, I want to take this place to just let everyone else, you know, who shops with you or works with you in any capacity that you guys truly care about the brands that you bring on. And it felt like me, but it felt like a new version of me. And, you know, it's just, it was, um, so thankful for what you did with that. Oh, I appreciate that, yeah, man. Thanks, I have to man. make sure the team knows too. I mean, it's like, it's a thing where I've said it before. I'll say it again. I don't take it lightly that level of trust that a brand is putting yeah, in yeah. with you. You know what I mean? Like that's not something I take lightly because I understand completely. I've worked on both sides of that, that coin. And when you give it to somebody else, you're like, Oh man, please don't like, don't fuck. Don't me make up. it. You know, don't make it look stupid. Cause, yeah. Cause you know, at that point too, you get to a, especially when you're a new brand, you're like this, they have more cachet than me. Like they, they've, they can reach more people. The if stockist. they put it out there and it's not at what I want it to be at, they've now reached more people than I did with my product and they might fuck it up. And it's like, it's nerve wracking in that way. But like I said, we also want to make sure it's done through a lens that makes it make sense for us or like our customer, how we Mm -hmm, portray mm -hmm. things. And it's like, but I can say it's, it's not, it's very rarely that we just go, I don't know, shoot it like this. I mean, sometimes there's like a sneaker drop where it's like, we just got to drop it tomorrow. You got to get it out. He's got a good clean photo. That's one thing. But in any other case, especially if it's a new brand, like our first time we're carrying a brand, we'd really try to put like a lot of, without it being fussy, put a lot of thought into like, how we're going to do it. And I try to, I really truly believe in eclecticism, like where if it's a bunch of nice things with a bunch of nice people who are shooting it the best way they know how it will come out. Right. Like as long as like everyone is like, you know, being really honest with what they think and what the, you know, how they think it would look best and whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it always comes out nicely because it's like, I just, when we started this, I was just, I was so frustrated with stores in that 
I'm just so sick of seeing so many stores pigeonhole themselves. Like we only do this thing, you know what I mean? And it's like, that's good because it's great for a customer who wants to digest just that thing. They can find you. But at the end of the day, I don't know anybody who dresses like that. I don't know. I, I know so few people who are like, I wear a hundred percent black or whatever. And it's like, well, you're not shopping with me anyway. You found a brand and you stick to that thing. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So you're mm-hmm. doing your own thing, which is cool. But like, I just believe, I believe in like, I want a closet to look pretty eclectic. I want to have high. I want to have low. I want to have drapey. I want to have tight. I want to have like a little bit of everything. You know what I mean? And I think that that's what I'm always trying or we're trying to like accomplish with, with how we shoot things and do things is like, I want it to feel approachable because I think I, I just, again, you'll understand coming from the Midwest, like I don't want things to feel like they first did fashion wise, where it feels untouchable, unapproachable, like it's, like it, like you have, you know, like gate caps, like you have to know somebody to like be into this stuff or get into it or mm-hmm. a t- a touch it or feel it. And I just don't want that. I just feel like that's such a gross, that shouldn't be what art is about. And I believe in this is art. So it should be kind of for everyone. And yeah, there's different values to things, whether you own it or don't own it is irrelevant. You can still appreciate it. And I just want it to feel like all the time, like, oh, I could see myself wearing a crazy junior piece. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they were able to shoot it in a way that made me feel like, yeah, I, I I get what I get what's going on on both sides. I get that this is this beautiful like art piece, but it's also it's meant to be. I mean, I don't think anyone creates anything that's that's clothing that isn't meant to be worn. Like that doesn't mm-hmm. make any sense. The whole point is that it exists and has a life. And it, I think, clothing also is one of those few things where after use it changes and is different. I mean, it just is. I mean, everyone knows that like what a denim jacket feels like day one versus you know year thirty is it's it's a it's an entirely new thing at that yeah, point. Yeah. And uh and and I want and I want people I want to invite people to like to to do that. So it's really important that we have that we do have this kind of like that sort of ethos that goes into uh to styling and how we present brands for sure. So I'm I'm really it's, it's always nice to hear because sometimes it's like screaming into the void where you're like, I hope people get it. I think people get it. It's yeah, selling well, yeah, but you're yeah, like, you're not yeah. sure. So it's always nice to hear from a brand or a customer that's kind of like, you know, like that, like where it like reiterates what we're, what we're trying to do yeah. and, and, and that we're doing it the right way. So that, that, that feels great to hear. Yeah. Thanks yeah, for that. Definitely. And also build a throw it back your way, bro. Like yeah. only positive reactions over here, dude. Uh, it was our first time obviously releasing your product. And um, I have one more question regarding, stuff because you, you did touch on this, but like most of the stuff that I heard from our community and our customers, either in store or online is like, man, these fabrics are fucking crazy. That rust silk fabric looks nuts. Or like yeah. there was that dead stock Japanese herringbone indigo dyed plaid. And that was just, just the fabric alone. I was, I was hyped to tell everybody like, yeah, look at what he found, dude. Like, I think this is a perfect execution for this fabric. <laughs> Um, yeah. real quick to touch on that. Cause I, I did want to know, do you, do you think that you lead with fabric? Like, cause I know you've, you've mentioned to me that you will go out and hunt dead stock fabric. You go out to New York. Like what's your process behind that? Do you feel like when you're designing a garment that you have, like, you know what, this fabric would be perfect for this. We use top coat as an example, or, you know, if you're designing a, another silhouette for a pair of pants, is there, well, you envision this with like a suiting wool or a lightweight denim. Like, how do you, do you lead with fabric? Because in my opinion, that's the first thing I noticed about with the William Frederick product right off the bat. Yeah, absolutely. So I think with silhouette, and I'm going to follow this up with another question for you after about my brand, because I'm curious mm-hmm. on an honest perspective, but I, I, intentionally designed for immediacy and so i want people to just walk up and i don't really want there to be much confusion i almost want there to be some curiosity some excitement when it gets Mm -hmm, touched mm -hmm. and so for me when you're looking at my silhouettes they're relatively simple but they fit every single body type and it surprises a lot of people but here in cleveland let's say 70 percent of my sales are women and that's because mm. of the way I cut my pant. And it's slightly high waisted, higher rise, but it has this very subtle billowing at the hips on most of my styles. And it flatters women's bodies of all shapes and proportions. And that's always been my goal is to, you know, almost coax someone towards the clothing. And then when they get there, the fabric really takes it to another level. And it's just, you know, because a lot of, especially here in Cleveland, I think a lot of people are intimidated by the idea of fashion or clothing brand. So I always have it in my mind to, you know, 
just give it a shot, try it on. And then when they realize they look and feel great in that, that's the ultimate win for me. So that's a long-winded answer initially to say, from a silhouette standpoint, yes, it's relatively simple, but there are a lot of very thoughtful details in there that you wouldn't see just from a product shot. Sure. And, you know, I fabric, textile, that just happens to be my strong suit. Organically, it wasn't, you know, I study it inside and out every day. I'm obsessing over fabrics because that's what I'm really drawn to or textures, tones, and then I'm reading books about color theory. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's always down a rabbit hole to learn, learn, learn. And when it comes to the fabric sourcing, you know, I'm just trying to communicate through that fabric in a way that is a little unexpected. You know, yeah. it's like it's like with the cafe jacket, the what seemed to be the biggest hit out of the gates was that rust silk matka. Yes. So, you know, it's taking like how many truckers are on the market that are 100 percent silk? Like that's and I don't mean that in an arrogant way. It's just that's my thought process is like, OK, yeah. this okay. is still incredibly approachable, but it's a little bit different. And it's something that you probably won't find with any brand of any size. No, yeah, right I'm on. sure I'm sure there's a brand in India or Japan or somebody that also uses silk maca for a trucker or a boxy jacket. I'm not the one of one, but I think just that those types of thoughts when you're putting together and you know, I use a lot of suiting fabric from Italy now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm using those for button-ups instead of suits though. So like that wool hounds tooth plaid that is on your site that's you know rust tan. Yeah. That that's meant to be a suit but i just love taking something like that and applying it to a shirt and i think that's where i'm talking about when you coax someone in and it's like and then they go to touch it and they're a little bit surprised because of the fabric that was selected for that yeah, yeah i mean yeah. absolutely obsessed over fabric you know and i've, and I've got it pretty narrowed down now for you know, when i'm doing a spring summer collection it's it's mostly fabrics from belgium japan and ireland and that's just because that's what I've been drawn to for those weights of fabrics. And then when I get into fall winter, you start digging a little bit more into that's when the Italian suiting fabrics come out and the wools and the yeah, yeah. little bit heavier silks and heavier hemp fabrics and things like that. So it's, you know, I do have kind of a, even a regional decision-making process that I go through with the seasons. Yeah. I mean, the fabrics are, I mean, that's, I think, people probably wouldn't expect a brand of my size to use the type of fabrics that I do. I definitely think that's the thing that separates sure. me from that's everyone it. else competing yeah. with me. That that's what that I think that's what I that's what I was trying to say is like, you know, it's not a huge brand. It, it's obviously growing, but we were the first stockists online, so it's like clearly yeah. clearly it's growing and that that that's what I wanted to communicate is like, damn, this level of intention like sourcing dead stock fabrics and like you said like taking a silk fabric and being like this would be cool it has enough structure let's make a, a trucker jacket let's make a boxy jacket out of it. you know what i mean um but yeah that was it was the intention behind this fabric because you can i'm sure you can go get fabrics dude you can get any fabric you want you know what i mean i will um, say i to touch on this though you know to use the term trade secret, I yeah. when I entered the industry, I was a little bit naive and I was surprised by how protected these resources are by other designers. Yeah. Like like uh, the like like the sources, the, yeah, the place like, you'll go and Yeah, like I mean, there's a reason only a few brands use butcher linen. It's because yeah. you can't find it. It's hard to yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like so linen, even yeah. I think like if I were to pat myself on the back, it's like a brand of my size found butcher linen. I mean yeah, that's, yeah. and that's like and it took me years and it's like I'm relentless yeah. with this stuff. I'm already like there's different types of fabrics right now that I'm on the hunt for and I'll find them eventually, but it's not like I can go out there and do a custom bolt of fabric at like five hundred thousand yard minimums and I buy fifty, sixty yards. So it's just <laughs> yeah. you know, I yeah, can't even yeah can't even get there but it's yeah. yeah to me it's about i was just like i was on a mission i was going to get my butcher linen <laughs> and that's and i think the unfortunate thing is is like these fabrics are so specialized that when you use it you get compared to the other two or three brands that use sure. it and it's like yes like, but we're yeah. completely different worlds and yeah. yeah and i'm essentially a very small brand and i think you know you were kind of trying to get that out of me as a small brand and you know give myself credit there for the fabrics that yeah, i use do it up 
Now, I try I try not to be <laughs> talk that way, but I do think, you know, if I were to own the things that I do really well, I think if you look at the other brands that are my size, that I don't think really anyone from a fabrication or a photography, videography, content, world creation. I think I'm very in my own space there. And I don't really think that a lot of brands my size have the care and attention to detail when it comes to those things that I have. And I think that is where I've started to separate myself a little bit. Yeah, for sure, man. Let's go, yeah, bro. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, that that feels like the feedback that we've yeah that we've gotten. Yeah. Yeah. Good shit. Well, so here's well, a question is, for you. Oh, yeah, yeah, can I, I ask one? For, yeah, 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 of course. Yeah, of course. A question for us. Yeah. So yeah. when, because I, I was thinking, I'm always asking this, and not always asking, but always thinking about it. And I haven't, you know, really don't get the opportunity to ask these questions from people who handle product on a daily basis. But do you think, you know, a brand like me, I'm designing for immediacy. I'm always a little tempted, you know, because I do get some criticism and feedback is that some of the silhouettes are just a little bit simple to the eye. And Sometimes I really want to do artisanal or a little bit of avant-garde here. Do you think that brands like me who feel that pressure, if they're confident in their ability to execute that on a small scale here and there, should lean into something a little bit more creative to identify, to separate the brand? Because, I mean, everyone has, I mean, the product market is so oversaturated, as you know. So do you think that it's good to feel that pressure to, you know, create something that's a little less obvious? and immediate to kind of tap into anymore. I know I that's think, a super complicated question. Yeah, no, definitely. But, but I think, I, I think I understand what you're asking and, and it's like, I think you should do it. If you, like you said, if you feel confident in your ability and yeah. you feel like that's something you, like you have an idea that you feel like need, like authentically needs to be out there in some way, then you should do that. If you don't feel that way, then focus on being the guy who's able to get really insane fabrics that you could absolutely and should be charging way more for, but you're just a smaller <laughs> brand still. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, then that should be your thing. I think that you should only do things that make you excited to do them as a person. You know what I mean? So if you're excited yeah. to do it and you think other people are going to resonate with it, then I think you should absolutely do that. I mean, it's, it's tricky because there's plenty of brands who've made an entire large brand out of going we have amazing fabrics nothing super complicated here you know what i mean yeah. like i mean laura yeah. piana for christ's sake i mean like brunella cuccioli some of these that like are fabric brands they basically make like i mean yeah they add new stuff but it's not none mm -hmm. of it's complicated it's by any stretch yeah. it's a pretty straightforward look that they, that they go with and it's really all about the fabrics so you yeah. can definitely i mean la Mer's kind of i mean he, yeah, he yeah, takes yeah. more risks for sure but it's the, the risks are modest risks you know what i mean and it's really more about look and feel and vibe you know what i mean and mm -hmm. so so i understand that you don't want to get too outside of a lane if you i think if you look at what you're making and you're like this doesn't feel this feels pretty outside of the realm then maybe you then maybe take one thing out you know what i mean but it's you can do, you can chanel it a little bit but if yeah. but if it, if it just feels like good to you then i think you should do it i mean because like i said i think people want people that are authentically expressing yeah. their interests and what they're and and, and you, like you said if if you're feeling that way it's usually you're not the only one feeling that way because if you're thinking about your brand non-stop then there's other people thinking about it now and then and they've probably had the same feeling like so that's like sometimes i'm like yeah, like we've had X amount of brands for a certain amount of times and they're doing well, but I'm just feeling this one with like, you know, I'm feeling a way about a certain brand. I'm feeling like people have maybe lost interest or if I'm starting to feel that way, it's usually a domino effect. If I'm starting, that's the, there's going to be a collective conscious that's also feeling that way too. Um, so it's like, and if you're feeling like, hey, it's time for me to like push, then I think you, then I think it sounds like brand's ready for that. Yeah, I think for me personally in the position that I'm in now, I you know, a lot of the momentum and growth that I'm experiencing right now is for what I am offering right now. But at the same time, I feel this new pressure, just being transparent, because yeah. new eyes are on the brand. And it's yeah. also, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to get comfortable with that. And I'm, mm -hmm. so I'm already thinking like two, three new silhouettes for fall winter that I'm working on right now, that you'll probably get too. But that's what I didn't want to, you know, send the same batch of silhouettes to you verbatim just with the fall winter fabrics that felt too lazy so you know when fall winter rolls around you're going to see probably two or three new things entirely Sick. yeah when you i mean that's hear. that that's that narrowing thing bro like that's just that like every time you feel like okay i've got this a little bit on lock and it's in like a, in you know and it's and, and i'm opening up that that perspective a little bit then you go let's narrow that gap a little you know what i mean like yeah, and yeah. you make it a little i always kind of put the goals 
just a little further away because if I achieved them too easily, then you know it's not. It, that it usually means it wasn't yeah, worth yeah, achieving. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? Goal, yeah. So you d- I think that that's a perfect place to be in. Like I'm feeling good. I'm feeling like it's time. Then yeah, it feels like. I mean, if you if you're thinking about your business all the time, then organically you'll know you, you already know the answer to your question yeah, that yeah. you're asking. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, bro, this has been a this has been a really nice talk to you, man. I, I, you know, we always say this a lot, but it's always cool when you get to talk to people that normally it's like a quick conversation we have or yeah, something like yeah. this to talk for like an hour and a half and just get to know each other and like know your process. Something that's been really cool, man. I think people are gonna love to have heard from you here. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, and of course, I mean, I've been excited about this, oh, and yeah. yeah, I mean, you guys are also hilarious. I listened to the, <laughs> oh. I was cracking up every time I listened to, I mean, Chase specifically, I mean, he's like, you're equal parts endearing and concerning. And <laughs> it's just so yeah. fun to listen to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I like that. <laughs> yeah. I think that that's, that's, that's the, a good summation. Yeah. That's pretty perfect. Yeah. I mean, shooting <laughs> Very <that>. good analogy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Well, you know, everybody check out what we've got on our website. Check out what, what's, what's the, you want to shout out your website real quick? Yeah, give us some ads. Yeah, absolutely. The website's just williamfrederickclothing.com. The Instagram is williamfrederick.wf. Uh, we've got some new pieces. I'm actually going to do a story sale for the first time in like four or five years. We did some naturally dyed pieces with Cara Marie Piazza. And it's really, really beautiful stuff. Most of it has sold from my five year anniversary event, but I'm still going to put that in some one of one butcher linen items and some different things. So that'll probably be in the story early next week. So, and it'll just be one of ones email, I'll send the invoice out, that Sick. type of thing. So, Hell yeah. yeah. Well, everyone should check it out because we have we have a small selection of a much bigger co- collection and things are changing all the time. So if you don't if you don't if you've only seen what we have, definitely check out what yep. he's got too and keep checking in with us because we'll obviously do a bunch more. Yeah. Uh Bill, again, it's been a pleasure, man. Appreciate yeah, it. Buddy. Think the world of you. Thanks yeah, for having me. Thanks for hopping Thank on. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.